Is this even our idea? Thank you all. Happy to be here at the TNG conference, Big Tech Day. Um, all right. Let's get this going. All right. We just need to get the, uh, there we go. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm John Romero, co-founder of id Software, and I'm gonna take you on a journey back to the beginning of id Software. Are you ready to be entertained? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I do realize that some of what I'm about to say may sound insane, but we were in our 20s when we started id Software, and we didn't know that there were any limits. So I grew up in a wonderful small town in Northern California named Rockland with a population of only 6,000. In the 70s, I was massively addicted to spending loads of time in dark arcades playing all the games there and getting really good at them. In 1979, before anyone had a computer at home, including me, I went to the local college when I was 11. And I started learning basic from the college students there. I just went up to them and I asked them what were the words on the screen that they were typing. And I wrote them all down and I started experimenting with them on my own on the, uh, HP, the HP 9000 mainframe that was there. So to keep me at home, my parents got an Apple II Plus. So I was done going outside and I spent all my time programming games on that computer. So a few years and 20 Apple II games later, I finally learned 6502 assembly language, which was the language that all fast arcade games were written in. Then I could really make 80s games like these. Well, not quite arcade games, but home computer games, which were on the Apple II. Let's just say that the Apple II was my personal home arcade, as well as one million other Apple owners. So when I was a sophomore in high school, I did some programming for the Air Force when I was 15 years old. We lived in England, and then my stepfather, he worked for the Air Force. So in order to get into the high school coding class, I showed the teacher that I could program in 6502 assembly language, and I ended up at the aggressor squadron the very next day. I was literally coding in a vault. Because I was a kid, they had to give me false data to use with my code. I can't tell you what I was programming. That's classified. <laughs> uh, it's an odd but true story. So after high school, I kept making games. By 1987, I was working at Origin Systems. And my first job was porting 2400 AD, an RPG, from the Apple II to the Commodore 64. By this time, I had made 74 games and three previous startup game companies called uh, Capital Idea Software, Inside Out Software, where I ported Might and Magic 2 uh, to the Commodore 64, and Ideas from the Deep, and I was 21 years old. So I went to work at a company that was named SoftDisk at the start of 1989. I learned how to program a DOS PC there, and I was basically making a small game or a utility per month for about a year. Then I created a subscription game product called Gamer's Edge at Softdisk, and I had to hire a team of game developers. So I hired John Carmack and Adrian Carmack, who were not related, <laughs> into my department for programming and art. And then Tom Hall came in at night to help us out since he was already working at Softdisk and he loved making games. So this was the first time that any of us had worked with another person on a game after we had been making them alone for 10 years each. And it was really incredible. While creating our first game together, which is called Slordax, John Carmack discovered the smooth scrolling trick on the PC. Tom Hall and John stayed up until 5 a.m. making a demo. It was called Dangerous Dave in Copyright Infringement. <laughs> so the next day, I saw the disc on my desk, I ran the demo, and I watched the screen scroll smoothly, pixel by pixel. So it was a massive eureka moment for me. It was like a bolt of lightning hit, and I'll elaborate you know, why that was in a moment. Yet software was born that instant on September 20th of 1990. So one thing led to another. And we spent about a week putting together a demo of Super Mario 3 for Nintendo, which they really liked, but they decided not to publish it because they decided to only put their games on their own NES platform, the Nintendo platform, which was a really smart move. So no problem. We just used a technology for a different game, which was called the Commander Keen Trilogy. 
So like, why would a side scroller be a huge hit on PCs in 1990? Well, it was because no games on the PC could smooth, scroll horizontally smoothly per pixel. The PC had been out since August of 1981, and in nine years, no one had figured out how to make the screen scroll smoothly pixel by pixel until this dangerous Dave and copyright infringement demo, which led to Commander Keen. So the Commander Keen trilogy provided the start of the company, and we, uh, and we made these three games in three months, from September 20th to December 14th of 1990. And it was a massive hit for us, and it was so popular that people cosplayed it as Keen for years at events. This game also pioneered the creation of game engines. We designed the game as an engine so that it operated on different data to make different games. It was, it was really the only way that we could get the trilogy done so quickly. In fact, in 1991, when we were working on Keen 4 for the next trilogy, we started licensing the engine for the first time. So it was the beginning of the modern engine licensing business that basically Unity and, and Unreal have. So development in our games went very smoothly and quickly because we stuck to some core principles that are important even today. So through this talk, I'm gonna highlight some of our core principles. I'd like to highlight something else right now, namely this photo. Has anyone seen this photo before on the internet? One person. <laughs> uh, it's a picture of us at our lake house in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is where we basically started. And so the funny thing is that people have asked me for years, what's in this picture? So I spent some time analyzing it, and this is what you see in here. So this is uh, me and John in September, early September of 1990. We're working on the Super Mario 3 demo that we planned on sending to Nintendo. We both worked on this huge Dungeons and Dragons table that John had. Uh, we used to play D&D &D on the weekends, and those sessions led to ideas for future games like Doom and Quake. So Tom Hall took this photo, and the computers were brought home from work on the weekends. So this photo was taken on a Saturday or a Sunday. On top of the monitor is one of those old Intel reflective astronaut plushies. And to my left is a notepad, which was just a task list of, of bugs to fix. And that's our high-level task list, what we had to get done to finish the demo. Just a whiteboard leaning on a, uh, on a chair. And then this is Tom Hall's area where he was actually doing all the graphics for the demo. It was really just us three. He recorded gameplay on a VCR and he played it back, pausing the action so he could duplicate the tiles exactly in Deluxe Paint 2. It was a Photoshop of the, uh, of the 90s, early 90s. So the TV set had a 13 channel selector on it and it was connected by an RF modulator, so it was very old school. So its software was formally founded on February 1st of 1991, and we made 12 games that year. <clears throat> Shadow Knights, Dangerous Dave and the Haunted Mansion, Rescue Rover, all these games, we actually took two months to make each game, but we made two games at once. This is basically due to us having 10 years of intense game development experience before this, but it's also due to our first principle. So we had no prototypes, we just made the game uh, we polished as we developed. We didn't depend on polish happening later. There wasn't any time. So always maintain constantly shippable code. This is how we made so many games so quickly. We had the entire game in our heads. We just needed to quantify what needed to be created, and we just went working on it until the game was finished. There were no prototypes for our games. Um, we just made them. But remember that this was a small team of only four people, and we could do this. Large teams absolutely require more planning. Time for a quick story. So one day, it rained really hard, and the lake behind the lake house uh, in Louisiana was just flooding all the streets around. And I really needed to get to work. Like, we were furiously working away on our games, and I really was excited to get back to coding. So I just got ready for work, and I went down the street, and then I saw this. The entire road was flooded. So. I did what I had to do. I basically waded through this huge flood uh, with water snakes. I mean, it's Louisiana, there's alligators, there's water snakes and everything. <laughs> Didn't matter. I went all the way to the house, took another shower, and then I started coding. Um, we were so excited to be making our games 24-7. Um, 
And I also, also note that during this year of 12 games, we moved id software from Louisiana up to uh, Wisconsin. So that takes a little bit of time out of game development, uh, which was two games at that time. And uh, we couldn't really afford to have anything go wrong while we're making our games at this fast pace. Uh, so we created another principle that really kept us developing quickly. Like it was incredibly important that our game can always be run by the team. So we bulletproofed our engine by providing defaults on load failure. So if you have 100 people trying to make a game that will not run, you're paying 100 people to sit around and wait for it to get fixed. Super expensive. So we recognize the importance of keeping the game always playable, and we decided to bulletproof our engine by making all input totally solid. So game engines typically fail because they're trying to load bad, uh, corrupted, or non-existent data. So checking for this and providing a default for a failure case keeps the game running, and it will quickly show you what is missing. So if you fail to load a sprite in the game, just show a bagel. Uh, if the theme song isn't loading, play something horrible <laughs> for people to listen to until they fix it. Uh, missing a sound effect, same thing. So after 1991, id Software's first stage of company development was complete, and another important principle was in effect. So keep your code absolutely simple. Keep looking at your functions. Figure out how you can simplify further. We wrote all of our games, including Quake, in basic C, uh, not C++. So stage two is about to begin. It was August of 1991. We decided to move to Madison, Wisconsin. Tom Hall and I visited at that time, and we found it to be like really nice. Like Tom used to live there while he was going to college, so we all just all four of us moved up there, and uh, we continued working on our games. Uh, only four months later, we were found dead in the snow, victims of Wisconsin's brutal winters that we did not research. <laughs> Moral of the story, do your research. We knew how to program an assembly language, but not how to ask Tom Hall, hey, what are winters like up here? <laughs> so after six months, we moved to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a new principle. Great tools help make great games. Spend as much time on tools as possible. I wrote a tile editor back in 1991. It was called TED for tile editor. TED was used for 33 shipped retail games, several of which were 3D games as well, like Hover Tank, Catacomb 3D, Wolfenstein 3D, Spear of Destiny, Rise of the Triad, Corridor 7, and others. So it was January 1992. We decided to just go all 3D based on Catacomb 3D's uh, promise of possibly a cool game. It looked cool, it just didn't play very cool. Uh, so Wolfenstein 3D was the game that we made. It took us four months of development time to get to the shareware launch with one episode of Levels from the idea. So it took two more months after that to finish all 60 levels and create a hint book for the game. Uh, first month, the game sold 4,000 copies, all priced at $60 each with no marketing. So it did really, really well. <laughs> Spirit Destiny came right after that. It took two months. It's a prequel to Wolfenstein 3D, and it was just retail only. And then right after that, Tom Hall traveled to Kentucky to work for a couple months on what was called Wolfenstein VR. Yes, it was 1992 VR. So back in the days of Commander Keen, I had discovered a small three-person game company called Raven Software in Madison, Wisconsin. Called them up, uh, went over to their place, and we just introduced ourselves. And flash forward seven months later, uh, we did a little bit of work with them by modifying the Wolfenstein 3D engine, and we licensed to them for a game called Shadowcaster. Shadowcaster's technology improvements were sloping floors, uh, lighting, and fog. This engine looked better than Wolfenstein 3D, but it just wasn't good enough for our next game. So John Carmack spent some time thinking about how more advanced should this new engine be for this game that we decided to call Doom. So based on the rapid development of our previous games, we came up with another really important principle. We are our own best testing team, and we should not allow anyone else to experience bugs or see the game crash. So we don't want to waste anyone else's time. We would test thoroughly before we checked in our code. 
no throwing it over the fence for testers to find and put in a bug database and then fix it later. So a wasteful cycle. Uh, id Software had no QA. Uh, after 1992, id Software's second stage of company development was complete along with another principle. It's a very important one. As soon as you see a bug, you fix it. You do not continue on. You do not, if you don't fix your bugs, your new code will be built on a buggy code base and ensure an unstable foundation. If you check in buggy code, someone's gonna be writing code on your bad code. And you can just imagine how much waste that creates when you finally desert, you know, decide to fix that bug later on. You're gonna be rewriting a lot of code. Um, <clears throat> so the ideas for Doom came from our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, which was full of demons. We also love the movies Evil Dead 2 and Aliens. So Doom's design was a mashup of these ideas. At the beginning of Doom's development, we created a new core principle. This was a, a big step for us. Use a development system that is superior to your target to develop your game. So before Doom, we were making games for DOS computers while we were developing on DOS computers. So this is what it looked like. Um, there's a Borland, 3 uh, Borland C 3.1 IDE on our main 14-inch monitor. And then when we were debugging, we had a secondary 12-inch amber monitor that we used Turbo Debugger on. Uh, not that these tools were bad at all, but we knew that we could do better if we used more powerful computers and a more advanced operating system to develop our games. So we developed Doom on Next Step workstations. They were light years ahead of DOS. Next Step eventually turned into OS X. This also meant that one of our core principles was upheld, which was that great tools help make great games. We could make far better tools on Next Step. So DoomEd and QuakeEd were uh, two of the most important tools that we had for creating levels. They both really helped us uh, make levels very quickly and, um, and to test them very, very fast on this operating system. So you might not have known this, but we had five people on our team while we were creating Doom. After Tom Hall left, we hired Sandy Peterson and Dave Taylor, which brought us up to six people. So unbelievably, while we were making Doom, we had to stop all production on the game to create the Super Nintendo version of Wolfenstein 3D as fast as possible due to an unmet obligation that we had made seven months earlier. <laughs> so we were starting from never having programmed a Super Nintendo, and it took us three weeks because we had to learn the hardware. Uh, then we jumped back into making Doom again. So we uploaded the shareware version of Doom to the University of Wisconsin server on December 10th of 1993. The excitement for the game was just unprecedented. People were creating files in the upload directory that were sentences, like when.will.we.c.doom. We got random phone calls in the office asking when it would be out, and we never published our office phone number. <laughs> so another quick story. During the final day of Doom's creation, we worked 30 hours. We had the game running on all of the computers in the office to ensure that it was like solid when we put it out. But, however, on a couple computers, the game froze. The menu could be brought up, but the gameplay stopped working. So John Carmack thought about what could possibly be happening, and he figured out a solution without doing any debugging, and he was correct when he fixed it and we finally uploaded Doom after the five minute fix and more testing. And that bug had been there since we started the game on the day one. So at the beginning of 1994, I started working with Raven Software and developed Heretic using the Doom engine. I really wanted to see how an inventory system in a medieval version of Doom would play and uh, turned out really great. Does anyone remember Heretic? All right, a lot of Heretic players. We also made Doom 2 in 1994, over eight months, and it was released on September 30th. In addition to this, we did the Jaguar port of Doom ourselves. Again, we were multitasking and making multiple games. So we were two games in 1993 and three games in 1994. So in 1995, we started working on Quake. We had nine developers at that time. We had four designers, three coders, two artists, and I did both code and design. So I wrote QuakeEd, and I experimented with level design in full 3D. 
Again, we started with a completely co clean code base. No code from Doom was harmed in the use of uh, the creation of Quake. Um, and that was another one of our principles of development. Uh, write your code for this game only, not for a future game. You're gonna be writing new code later because you're gonna be smarter, and also you're not tying yourself down to the limitations of your past code. Get used to invent new things, inventing new things constantly. So Quake's engine was being developed by John Carmack and the rasterization was by Michael Abrash. This is before GPUs existed. I had to put every pixel on the screen. John Cash worked on the network code. He went on to become the lead programmer of World of Warcraft after Quake. Time for another quick story. So this relates back to our belief that developing in a superior operating system can result in a better game. So while we're making Quake, we made a deal with Cray Supercomputers to buy a Cray 6400 super server for half price. So our plan was to have our development team connected to it so we could BSP and light our maps as well as crunch whatever kinds of new data that we would create with our next game's engine. So the computer room in Quake's DM3 level was gonna be full of Cray computers, the C-shaped computers, as a reference to this new hardware that we were going to acquire. Unfortunately, Cray was bought by Silicon Graphics before Quake was done and the whole deal fell apart. So the computer room in Quake is filled with the usual rectangular mainframes instead of C-shaped Crays. So after publishing Heretic, I started working with Raven on the next game, which was called Hexen, and I wanted to see how an FPS would play with a hub-level system and character classes, and Hexen launched on October 30th, which is called Devil's Night, um, in 1995 during a Deathmatch 95 tournament that was happening at Microsoft's campus in Redmond, Washington. So a month later, I got Raven started on my next game design, which is called Hecatome. It was gonna be the third game in the series. This is a Heretic, Hexen, and Hecatome. The Hecatome was never finished. It was turned into Hexen 2, and it wasn't the same game design, so you can't go looking for Hecatome in that game. During this time, we noticed a small game company making some pretty cool games like Raptor, Call of the Shadows, and we brought this company down from Illinois to make a game that we would publish. So they called themselves Rogue Entertainment, and about 14 months later, they released a game called Strife, which used the Doom engine. It was an FPS RPG, and it was really, really fun. Uh, way back in 1996, it showed that combining genres could actually make a, a really cool uh, FPS. And nowadays, we have games like Destiny 2 and other FPSs, um, FPS RPGs, but Strife was the first one. Also during 1995, we created the Ultimate Doom, which was a retail version of the full version of Doom that you would register over the, over the phone. Um, and we added an extra, extra episode to it. And we also came out with master levels of Doom. So its offer was still nine developers in size, and we released two games in 1995 while we were still working on Quake. So work continued on Quake, and 14 months after we started, we released Q-Test on February 24th of 1996 for the world to test our internet gameplay. So during the next four months, we worked very hard to complete Quake. We also released Final Doom, which was created by Team TNT and the Casali brothers, and Death Kings of the Dark Citadel, which was an, ad an ad additional set of levels for Hexen. So one important principle that help, helped us get Quake done faster was this one, encapsulate functionality to ensure design consistency. So examples of this in Quake would be uh, the torches that are on the walls. Uh, we could have made the level designers place a torch model on the wall and then a fire model that animated and then a sound entity for it all at the same location, but then if we needed to move stuff around, something most likely would have gotten left behind and just pieces of entities would have been all over the place. So it was far easier to just create one entity as a torch uh, that had all of its functionality built in. So water in the game uh, needed sound effect entities all over the surface of the water and uh, to just fully cover all the water areas and uh, same thing with the sky, and it, and it was, uh, you know, we wanted you to be able to hear water everywhere that you could see it. 
And if the water got moved around in level, you know, because you're changing levels constantly, all of those entities deleting and moving around, you know, something would have been left behind. It would have been kind of a mess. So it's easier to just make the game play the water sound whenever water is being rendered on the screen. Um, so it was a renderer level feature and it was out of the designer's hands. So it ensured consistency and it really saved a lot of memory and uh, we did the same thing for the Sky Audio in Quake. So I released Quake Shareware on June 22nd uh, on the University of Wisconsin at Madison's uh, site. Another quick story. While Michael Abrash was programming the renderer, he was interleaving CPU instructions with FPU instructions to calculate perspective correct texture mapping. So sometimes while he was playing the game, just for one frame, the game would show a completely different part of the map. So he isolated the only instruction where this could possibly happen and determined that it was impossible for it to be an invalid value. So he had a friend from Intel come over and go through the same analysis and his friend agreed, yes, that's totally correct, um, but there is a known error with the floating point divide instruction on the Pentium. <laughs> so it was a hardware error and there was nothing that we could do about it. So we just left, it, we just left our code there um, and now this bug is, is known as the Pentium FDiv bug. You can look that up on Wikipedia. So game, uh, Quake is a game that introduced the world to mouse looking, uh, high speed, true 3D world, uh, internet multiplayer, and in-game consoles where you can pop up a console and just type commands into the game. Clans sprung up immediately as did esports and tournaments everywhere. Uh, Quake World launched five months later because of this, which was a much better way of playing um, big clan matches. So making games was and still is our life. Like we love it more than anything else as you can tell by our release of 28 games in five and a half years by less than 10 people. Uh, many other games were released that used our license technology over the years, and here's a couple more core principles that we learned from all of this work. Uh, try to code transparently. Tell your lead and your peers exactly how you're going to solve your current task and get feedback and advice. Don't treat game programming like it's a black box. Uh, the project could just go off the rails and cause delays. And programming is a creative art form based in logic. Every programmer is different and will code differently. Don't waste time focusing on a rigid coding style. It's really the output that matters. So thank you very much. And I will answer questions now after this. Plenty of time for questions. Lots of time for questions. <laughs> you can ask whatever you want. <laughs> ah, sorry. There's one over there. One interesting development in the history of games, you've talked a lot about releasing your games as shareware, and, and then that, that would kind of get people into it, and then you'd sell it uh, afterwards. And now, now these days, it's, it's, it's Free-to-play is the big model, free-to-play and selling add-ons and, and stuff online. Where do you see this development going in the future? Um, the funny thing is I kind of look at free-to-play as just a newer form of shareware um, because you're giving people a game to play and if they want more, then they can buy more stuff. You know, um, like it's episodic, like episodic purchase kind of stuff where you would just play the first thing. Um, there's a lot of different um, model, you know, business models now in the industry, and, and they all work for different kinds of games. Uh, microtransactions work for games that are designed for microtransactions. You know, that's a totally different type of design when you're making a game for microtrans versus um, a subscription-based game that uh, doesn't want to be different because of its business model. So, a game like World of Warcraft. Um, that is a subscription model still. Um, basically, can still, they can still do the subscription model because people are still going to pay it because they want those characters. They're going to continue playing the game um, and they want the 
they want their accounts around for years, so they just keep on paying it and keep on playing because they, they, they love the social element and they like the expansions. And they're still paying for expansions on top of it, so it is kind of like an episodic as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like a subscription-based with a big episodic purchase once every year or so. Um, but yeah, lots of games are, uh, most games are free though nowadays. Uh, and they have the option for an in-app purchase. So um, we, we were doing something kind of new back then by giving the games away for free because it was something that didn't really happen. Like back in the day, there weren't even demos. You couldn't download demos for games. And there were no such things as cover CDs on magazines either. They're, like what you did was you went to the store and you really hoped that what you saw in the back of the box was what that game was going to be. There was no way that you were going to find out by playing it actually before you bought it. So it was really everybody taking a big chance. And now the consumer's in control, really. And everybody can play anything they want. To, you know, they can really try out a game. So it just makes games better. You can't hide behind your box. All right, any other questions? Uh, over there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, uh, who and who came up with it and how did you come up with these uh, claymation-like 3D figures and then scanning them and then texturing them for, I, I think, since Doom? So yeah. it's, it seems like a really, really weird idea for some guys to just come up with that. Yeah, so for Doom, um, in games, like basically Wolfenstein before Doom, Adrian, Adrian was the guy who basically drew all of the characters and did all the animation. And not only did he, this was, this was, this was more work than, than playing side scroll or platform games because he had to draw a character and it needed to rotate eight times and animate frames of walking and shooting in all rotations. So every character we put in that game was a lot of work for Adrian to do. And we knew that going into Doom that we were still going to be using sprites, but that we're probably going to have a lot more monsters in the game. And they were probably going to be way more elaborate than a human that you can kind of copy and modify, you know, with a different uniform, like in Wolfenstein. This is going to be an actual completely different shape, and it's going to take a ton of time. So how can we save time? And one of the fastest ways to save time is to rotoscope, you know, to scan in uh, something that you're creating. So we started with clay uh, because that was like the easiest thing to do. Uh, so, so Adrian sketched out what the character would be on paper, and then he uh, got the like Baron of Hell modeled uh, on a on a clay modeling like uh, a thing that you build that you build clay characters on. It's like a metal p post with a kind of a ball thing, and you put all the clay around it and model. And so he modeled the Baron of Hell. It looked exactly like his picture. And we built a Lazy Susan kind of thing. So it's a circle that we could rotate. It had specific rotation marks on it. And we had a video camera that was pointing at the clay thing, at whatever was on, this, on the stand. And so we would take a picture. This, this camera was hooked up to a next step, a next cube uh, workstation. So we would basically, on the computer, just capture a frame. And then somebody rotates the thing another like eighth, take another picture, and just do this. And then, you animate the character <laughs> a little bit, and you have to kind of remodel it because it's tearing it when you're animating. And then you do that all over again for all eight uh, rotations and for every animation. Um, and, and when you do an animation for a character, it's like there's walking, there's attacking, there's getting hit, there's getting killed, there's like whatever else it's gonna do. That's a ton of animation, ton of rotations, and, and so it really did help to create them uh, in some physical format where we could take a picture and then we just pixel edit over it. So the shapes and all the stuff is defined already, and now, so now you're just kind of defining the colors on the shape, and it, it went a lot faster, um, but the problem with the, uh, the tearing of the, of the clay got fixed when we got a Hollywood m uh, model maker to then start making all the characters so we didn't have to do it ourselves and we didn't have it ri ripping and stuff. So it was latex and metal and all that for the other creatures that we created. Yeah, we had a lot of, a lot of fun creating new ways of, of, of making stuff. All the weapons in Doom are actual just toys from a toy store. 
that we just put in front of the, the, the camera and take pictures. Rotate it, now you have a different weapon. <laughs> Um, yeah, any other questions? Uh, yeah. All right. I was wondering how did you organize yourself as a team working on a game or even on multiple games at the same time? How did you organize your code or your scheduling? Yeah, so we didn't have source control. Uh, <laughs> so we had floppy disks and uh, hard drives. So what we did was there were only four of us for, for the first, you know, for the first uh, couple of years. And what we did was we, we, we kind of divided up the work. So John was going to work on, on a specific part of the, of the game. And those C files were his files. And then I was going to work on a different part. And then I would have my files. And I, I have my headers. And he has his headers. And I think we had a common header that included the headers. So, so it, uh, it worked out really well. We didn't stomp on, stomp on each other's code. And we never went into each other's code because we just had a really good separation. It was like he was making the engine stuff and I was making the gameplay stuff. And uh, at the same time, Tom is working on levels, so that has nothing to do with the code stuff. And when I was working on levels, Tom and I would decide who's doing what level, so I'm not touching his and he's not touching mine. And so everything is just very, uh, like no one stomped on anyone else's stuff. And nobody's drawing art, so Adrian never got hassled with any problems. So um, each person was, even if I overlap on code and I overlap on, on uh, design, uh, it, was, it was already figured out who was going to do what, so there wasn't any stomping. And that's the only way for us to go fast. There was never a merge ever, because we just didn't do that. Um, so yeah, so we organized ourselves that way. And it was all just for speed. Like The organization was just to make us go fast in development. Um, so yeah, that's. If you have any other questions about the <laughs> follow-ups. Um, yeah, any other uh, things? Yeah. Programming, anything? Yep. Hi. Yeah. Um, so uh, you were publishing your games crazy fast. And you did it on purpose. Yeah. So today, with today's mobile, mobile games, a friend of mine is making a mobile game. And he's like, like uh, for one year in beta now. And he's like, it's not finished yet. I need to have the shop in. I need to have that in. Balancing is not perfect. And I'm like, it's never finished. So what kind of tip <laughs> would you give a developer like that, or uh, so, so, so how to get it out? Yeah, so the first, the first part of any project that's really important is just to scope the project. Like, how much are you going to actually make? What does your release look like? And what are you going to do post-release? So you always have to have like the minimum viable product, or what is the thing that, that will identify it as a specific game that you can expand upon? Or maybe you're, designing, you're deciding not to even expand it, but just to release it, just to get it out. But you have to define what it is that you're going to make so it doesn't go on forever. Because if you don't have some sort of constraint, whether it's a date constraint or it's a uh, or it's a, a, a size constraint even. Like when we were making Quake, we had a, a size constraint. We basically said every level, none of the levels in Quake can be over 1.4 megabytes. If you make it over that, you got to fix the level. So it's just like that. That's like, wow, you could do all kinds of stuff in design. You could do all kinds of crazy, tricky things in design. But what it comes down to is, is that file too big? So you figure it out, designer. And so, you know, with, with uh, game development, it's, it's like, what are the features that are going in that game and, like, solidify what those features are? And you get, get everything quantified as much as possible. The only way to actually get stuff done quickly is to say what it is, what goes into it, how much stuff is in it, how fast can we get this thing done? You know, it is at the beginning. You do it at the very beginning. There was, there was a game that I had to make. Uh, I had to make it in two months. And I went to I went to consult at a company. They needed this game done. I, I, I came in on, on the 1st of August. They needed it shipped on the 30th of September. So, um, and, I, and I was making it for Facebook, so I'd never made a Facebook game before. And I really needed to like learn the ecosystem as fast as possible and the monetization uh, strategy that was common. And just like, what are games on Facebook like? And I spent three days researching everything about the games, the state of the art of the games. I didn't really care about the old ones. I only cared about the ones that were, that were recently released by the big companies that mattered. So I figured out what the monetization model was, what the, where the pressure points should be to monetize. 
and the kind of game that I needed to make because it needed to, to be a game that a 43-year-old woman played. <laughs> so I had to do that, and I had to like it too because you know I want the game to be really really fun, and um, and I want uh, not just making not not just to make a game for women, but I want to play it too. I want everyone to play it, but there are specific. Uh, things that I needed to put in the game as a designer that that a guy wouldn't see that Brenda could see and <laughs> she could identify the things that I needed to change. But we did this this thing uh, at the basically after doing this three days of research, I just got the the team that we had at that point, which is I think seven people at that point, uh, into a room and and basically told them for about three hours everything that was going to be in the game, all the assets that we needed to make all the systems that needed to be created, and it just got broken down into stuff that, that had to get created to make this thing work. Um, so even though a game is very creative and it's very organic, uh, sometimes it can't be too organic when you have a real tight constraint. So because I'd done it for so long, I, could, I knew exactly what was gonna go into it, and we could break it down, and everyone just started working. And uh, it actually took 19 extra days uh, because the game wasn't fun at the end of two months. And so luckily the, the owners of the company could, could let me have 19 more days to get it done and shipped. Um, but it turned out to be a really cool game and uh, eventually after six months, 25 million people per month were playing it. So it's huge. Thanks for the interesting talk. I'm interested in how much time do you actually get playing your games compared to developing? And do you also play other games, or is it like you only play, play test yours? Uh, the funny thing is I think I play my games, my games more than I play any other games, uh, just because we play Quake in the office every single day. <laughs> <laughs> so we have deathmatch every day. And yesterday I had a Doom tournament in Berlin. Um, so I, I just play my games a lot. Not that I'm, you know, not that I only care to play my games. I want to play lots of other stuff. Because um, it's really important to see what's happening out there because they give you really cool ideas for new things. Um, it just so happens that our office is addicted to Quake 1. So, <laughs> so everybody's playing it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I play mobile games and play games on uh, PC. I really don't play console games so much because I'm more, I like mouse and keyboard input more. Um, and there's just a ton of indie games out there to play. Uh, it's easier for people to make games um, that, that can be delivered on a PC or mobile than it is for consoles. So um, there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot more of them. They don't need to be approved by Sony or Microsoft. So I get to see a lot of Wild West crazy kind of stuff. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I had a question. So okay. as we've seen, you've created a lot of games, but are there uh, over here? <laughs> oh, there you are. Are there any noteworthy projects that you had to scrap for whatever reasons? Maybe some games we never heard about. Projects that I worked on that no one's heard about? Yeah, and that maybe somebody beat you to market or you created World oh, of Warcraft um, in the 90s already. Well, so when you make a lot of games, there's, there's, there's typically a bunch of games that just don't make it. Um, and if you don't talk about the games that you're making, then nobody knows that you didn't actually ship something. <laughs> Um, I've made 40 games at least that haven't shipped. Um, but probably the biggest one that never shipped was an MMO that I was working on for four and a half years. I had 100 people every day working on it in the office. Um, and it was really amazing. It looked, it looked like World of Warcraft, but it was made for kids. And uh, the game didn't ship because the technology that we were using basically broke when the world got too big. And, that was a major, major issue, obviously. Uh, you can't ship this MMO when you can't actually make it the size that you've designed it. And to redesign the whole thing would have taken probably a year. We either fix the tech or we redesign the game in a different engine. It's going to take a year, and you can't have 100 people waiting for you to do that. So we basically just had to kill the game. It was about $26 million gone. <laughs> but you know, uh, you take chances. <laughs> You always have to fail so you can succeed later. OK, anybody else? Um, since yeah. money is being mentioned, so as a kid, I was a big fan of Commander Keen. Yeah. Um, but you know, I don't remember ever buying it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I forgot. <laughs> so 
So I wonder back in the early days when kids would exchange floppy disks in the schoolyard, how, how could you guys have made money or how did that work? That, like, that's, it's, it's, uh, well, we didn't need that much money back then. So, I mean, our first game, when, uh, here's, here's, here's something that like, you can all do. Um, when you're going, if you're going to make a game and you don't have a game company and there's no way that you can actually survive without actually making money, you do it at home in your spare time. So when we were making Commander Keen, we were actually working at Softdisk, and we we're making uh, from 10 to 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. We we're working on Softdisk games, and then from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. We we're working on Commander Keen, and then when it was the weekend, we took the computers out of the office to the house because we didn't even have computers. Uh, we didn't have the money to buy 386s. So um, we just took the ones from the office to the house, and then we could basically stay awake as long as we possibly could to keep coding as much as possible, and then bring them back early in the morning on Monday so nobody knew that everything was taken away. <laughs> <laughs> we closed our office door so no one could look in it, um, so no one knew what we were doing. And, uh, and so we were, we were making two games at a time even then before we left. But it's like we have a job, we're getting paid, and we can make this thing at night. And when we put the game out, uh, it took, it's it basically we we're gonna get a check in a month. So the game came out on December 14th. On January 15th, we got our first check. It was for $10,500, which is half of the money that it actually generated because we had a 50-50 split. And we're like, that's more money than all of us need to live on. Because <laughs> we don't care about, like we're not trying to get rich. We just wanna make games all day long that are our games that we own. So it was, it was a, it was something we're like, we're quitting. This is obviously the first month that we surprise release a game that was never marketed. And people are downloading it from BBSs even, and they're not even copying, they're barely beginning to copy floppies. We knew that it was gonna do better. And actually by, the, uh, by one year later, um, the company was making about 50,000 per month still off Commander Keen, uh, off the first one and a couple other little things that we were doing. So it was, it was doing really well, and we stayed the same size, so it was great. We could buy a lot of better computers, and we could buy file systems, and you know, uh, we could move around, we didn't have a problem with money, um, and we could just focus on making games and, and uh, pouring the money back in the, co in the company. So having, uh, and so like the piracy thing for us, uh, we didn't, we didn't, we were giving it away anyway, like we're giving shareware, the shareware copy away, and it was not that easy to spread games around back then. You had to have physically a bunch of disks, and you had to spend time and be in a physical location with somebody. So piracy was way lower than it is on the internet nowadays where it doesn't matter. Like, it, it, like it's instantaneous and it's everywhere, which is why everything's so free now. Um, but back then we could, we, uh, you know, it was, it was harder, but I mean, I got my start doing the same thing. I couldn't buy all these games for the Apple II that I needed to play to understand game design. So everybody does it, you know, in the, in the creators, uh, you know, if you read their stories later, like say Prince of Persia um, uh, creator Jordan Mechner, he created Karateka and stuff. He's got a really great story of, of how, how, how his career's been going. He's, he's done extremely well. People pirated the hell out of his stuff. You know, it was some of the best games ever. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't think it really hurts everybody. I mean, back then, I don't think it hurt as much. Today, it probably does because it's so easy to do it, um, which is why there's all kinds of copy protection on, uh, on consoles now. So yeah, that's how we could survive. We just we 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 just needed enough to make games. I really like the slides you threw in on design principles. I mean, and you also worked as a kid. I understand on some classified projects. Yeah. So do you have any any advice for the Boeing engineers for the seven three seven Max, or do <laughs> <laughs> advice? Yeah. About or do they talk to you? I mean, about their software, about their maneuvering. Uh, what is it called? Um, augmentation system. Oh, augmented reality yeah. or whatever? No, no, no uh, they, they call it uh, maneuvering uh, characteristic augmentation system or something. It's about these two crashes of brand new Boeing 737s, which yeah. uh, occurred because they tried to fix a, a design problem with the, with the hardware, with basically with the, place, the, the placing of the engines by some software. And yeah. they didn't tell the, the, the pilots what they actually had done. 
And I wonder if, if that is also some of your concern or whether, whether Boeing talks to you about that, for instance. I mean, That could easily happen in any game. I mean, when you have a team full of people, you're hoping that they're coding everything correctly. Yeah. Um, if you don't have really good communication on a team, you'll have things like 10 random number generators. <laughs> like somebody, someone new comes on the team and they're just like, where's a random number generator? And someone's like, I don't know. And so they just like make one. And it's like the 10th one that the somebody else made because they weren't actually onboarded the right way. Um, so communication really is, is the key to uh, making sure that your game isn't in some weird state. Um, hopefully that's the answer to the question. <laughs> You've had amazing successes that impact us to this day, but you also mentioned the low point of scrapping the game with 100 developers. How, do you have any advice on how to handle the high highs and the low lows, and maybe the quick change between high highs and low lows? Let's see. Um, high highs, uh, save all your money. Uh, that's one, one real smart thing. Um, and don't, uh, just keep on doing what you're doing because that's the reason why you're there. You know, don't change everything just because now you have a bunch of money. Um, like the thing that we had to do that was kind of new was we had to handle all of this press. Uh, we weren't used to being interviewed. You know, like we, I remember the first time we did an interview, it was over the phone for I think a radio station um, when we had just released Wolfenstein 3D. So that was the first time that we actually did an interview and it was really cool. We're like, wow, this is great. Like, they're going to actually print something about us. And uh, you know, fast forward you know, another year and a half or so, two years, and it was insane. Like, there's, it, like the phone was ringing all the time, and uh, there's a ton of incoming stuff. And uh, there, you know, journalists ask a wide range of questions. And you got to make sure that you have the right person who can answer all of those questions available. Um, so I was volunteered basically to do anything that was technical, any kind of uh, technical questions that the journalists had, I could answer every question about everything. And if it was more high level, then Jay, our CEO, could answer those. But it was, it was massive, you know, after Doom came out, just the amount of press. Even after Wolfenstein, there was a ton of press, but Doom was just like huge. And, and so the thing that we had to do different was we had to handle that stuff, but we didn't get bigger, unfortunately. Like it would have been, Good to have a communications manager in the company just to handle all of that all of that incoming stuff. Instead, I'm having to do it while I'm doing development as well. You know, so it's just uh, it was just a lot of work. Um, but you know, just keep keep it as 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 the same as you can for what the what success that you've that you've gotten. Sometimes you need to expand though. You know, like it would have been smart for us to actually get some more people to take on stuff um, a lot earlier than we did or even to change the, the, the structure of the company to handle Quake in a better way. Um, but those are just things that you learn while, while you're going through it. <laughs> Low lows are, um, expect that, uh, you know, uh, that failures are a, a way to get closer to a success. You're learning something. <laughs> um, right here. You got so many things right with Doom, which was not the first person shooter, not the first first person shooter, but um, one of the first. And uh, like, it seems like a stroke of genius that you hit so many things that people are still looking for today. And basically it's a multi-layered question. Like, why did you get so many things right the first time? And when you look at the industry, what people are producing, um, not many things live up to this level of hype, and especially to this level of still being played today. Like, there are not many games that came out in the 90s that are so much revered, and you cannot have planned for that, but Doom is still going strong. Like, there's a modding scene. Basically, you didn't just start the first-person shooter genre, but you also formed, in a way, the, the modding scene, and, like, you cannot have foreseen that, I guess, but when did you realize that, is there, that it is there? And why do you think that Doom uh, is still going strong today? Like you yourself released Sigil, I think, a couple of days even ago. Yeah. Uh, people are still releasing Doom wads today, maybe more so than Quake, but even Quake is still played a lot. You have your office sessions. There are not many games on this planet that achieve this level. So <laughs> yeah. where is it? 
come from? Uh, well, I think that, that after, um, after Wolfenstein, we, you know, there were things happening uh, just in the world that, were, that, were getting, that we were kind of taking advantage of. So the internet was just about to happen at that time. And we already were, uh, we had an intranet in our, in our company with a file server. We had BNC network. Um, <clears throat> and this was before we even had Next Step, like before we even had a Next, Next Step machine. Uh, so we knew that with, with uh, Doom that we wanted to have multiplayer, which was going to be, we think, a really big thing. Uh, because uh, if, you know, we were all about making fast games. And, and to imagine a really fast game where two people are going at each other, like that was not something that we'd ever seen. You know, uh, people who are who are in a in a 3D environment that are hiding and dodging and shooting with lots of different weapons, and using lots of different strategies that never existed. So, like we we thought about that idea, and we put together a list, uh, like a bullet point list, like you would see on the back of a game box. Like, what are the things that this game's going to do? And we made that bullet point list at the end of 1992 before we even started on on Doom, like actually making the game. So we decided, you know, obviously it's going to be shareware. We saw that with Wolfenstein, how hard people had to work to modify that game. It wasn't made to be modded. It used a modified Huffman compression algorithm with a dictionary linked into the executable, and the executable was then LZ uh, compressed. <laughs> so people had unexpanded that and pulled the dictionary out and figured out, hey, reverse engineered the Huffman stuff. They couldn't get it from the, the, the assembly language because it was too hard to, to kind of decode it that way. Um, but they, they figured it out. And um, they m made their own levels for Wolfenstein. So we saw like the insanity of these people really wanted to use Wolfenstein to make their own fun. And we decided at the very beginning, this is going to be an open game. Doom is going to be mod moddable from day one. Uh, we want to make it easy for people to change the game to be whatever they want. Like, we're going to give you something that we think is a really fun experience, but then we're going to let you change that experience. And we decided, like, the, the experience we give them shouldn't be changeable, so we, we put it in what we called an IWAD, an IDWAD, where's all the data is the name of that. Um, so we put everything that we were creating was in an IWAD. That was non-changeable, and it was the foundation for all of the PWADs, which were player wads, which is where all the levels and stuff come from, um, those PWADs would reference the IWAD data so, so they could be small. So a level could be really small. The IWAD is all of the textures and characters and all that, and the PWAD is just this little piece of level data that references all of that data. So it makes modding uh, easy to pass around. So we knew that modding was going to be something that people already wanted, so we're planning to give that to them. We knew Deathmatch was going to be really cool. Um, the engine was going to be beyond anything that we had seen before, so we, we, and we knew exactly what the engine would have in it. Um, so you know, by the end of 1992, really, the data structure for the world was already created, and, we, and John basically just had to figure out the fastest way to render that. So we had a great 3D engine, a moddable game, uh, multiplayer, uh, over modem and on LAN. Uh, it was peer-to-peer. -peer. It wasn't client-server at that time. Um, on top of that, uh, we, were using a real, uh, we were using a DOS extender to address four megabytes of memory instead of the standard uh, below one meg uh, limitation of DOS. So we were, we were, were trying to make the game uh, faster by loading up all the, all the art and everything into higher memory. Um, and uh, what we did was we put a press release out in January as we were starting to work on the game that said this will be the most technically advanced game ever. <laughs> as we're about to start working on the game, we tell everyone it's going to be the best game on the planet, which is nuts. But we knew that it was going to be really cool. And all we cared about at the time was just to make a better game than Wolfenstein. You know, it was like, Wolfenstein is going to be better than Commander Keen. So we're just trying to make the next thing blow away the thing that we're making already. Uh, that, was the, that was the goal. It wasn't like make the game live for 25 years or something. It was just make it right and spend a lot of time uh, balancing it. So the game design had to, be, uh, it had to be new. It had to be 
uh, had to feel like it was a revolutionary design. So it needed to get rid of things like uh, the, the, the things that arcade games had in them, like scores and lives and all that. We got rid of that stuff. We got rid of picking up things for points, you know, like that didn't make sense to this inherent story of a demon invasion, you know. So, um, so we, not that that's real. I mean, the thing, the thing that we liked about Doom was the idea that there's this juxtaposition of you're a space marine going into space and instead of finding aliens, you find hell, which is absolutely not something you would expect. And so that was just like really strange. So uh, we thought that that idea was, was pretty cool. And putting it all together along with the shareware uh, model where we could basically make what we thought was the best game ever and give it away, which is, didn't never happen. Like nobody does that. Um, the, and, and we wanted it to go everywhere too. So we did something different with Doom than we've done with anything else, which was not only put the shareware game out there on a BBS for, down, for download, but we went to the store and we saw all the places that put CDs in you know, boxes on the shelf. We contacted all those companies and said, if you put Doom in a box for 10 bucks, you keep all the money. We don't want any of it. We just want you to put it on the shelf. So there were 10 different copies of Doom on the shelves in all the stores, and it was really like, how cool is the box? You'll get that one. They all have the same version of, in, of Doom in it, because it's all just shareware. But nobody had done that before, where they're just saying, you can make money, and we don't want any of it. So it was everywhere. So it really helped the saturation, and we never repeated that. Um, but it, 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 really, it really worked out in releasing the source code for Doom was probably the biggest, most important thing that we did because then people could extend the engine to today or even into the future and make it even look better. It's like you can make it do what Quake can do now. So it's like extremely advanced and mapping techniques have got massively advanced and people still love pushing that engine. It's the easiest engine to make levels for, really. There's nothing easier. So we kind of knew that we were gonna make a really cool game but not that something that was gonna live for decades. Oh, people, people called up a 1-800 number and paid us, uh, I think it was 30 bucks or something, or $35 over, over, the, over the phone with a credit card. That's how we sold Doom, was over the phone. Um, and then eventually we got it in the stores and you know Doom 2 and all that stuff, everything got retail. But, um, but yeah, at the very beginning it was just on the phone. All right, is that it? Uh, okay, I think one last question over here. Oh good, one more question. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for the talk, it was super inspiring and my question is about inspiration itself. <laughs> so back then you said you were playing a lot of D&D &D and you were watching horror movies and being inspired by that, but you released Commander King. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what inspired you for this game <clears throat> and what inspires you now? So Commander King, so at the very beginning of id Software from, you know, Slordax really, uh, all of our games were designed by Tom Hall. So he was the creative director of the company. We had four people, we couldn't overlap all, all over the place. So someone had to be in charge of coming up with what was the next game that we were gonna make. And so Tom was the guy whose job it was. Whether he came up with the initial idea of the game or not, his job was to take that idea and break it down into all the assets and all the systems that had to be made. And then to just creatively guide it and go like, okay, we're gonna have we're gonna have this jungle level in this other you know he would come up with all the levels, he would come up with all the bosses, he'd come up with all the characters and the weapons and everything that we we're doing. And Tom was just a Tom was just a real positive guy. He is Commander Keen. Like Tom is Commander Keen, absolutely. You meet him in person, nicest guy ever. And so we were making his childhood basically. Uh, that's Commander Keen, his his childhood. Um, and so that's why all of our games were kind of like that. And then Wolfenstein was like me saying, we need to make Castle Wolfenstein. <laughs> we need to make Castle Wolfenstein in 3D and just like blow stuff away. And so that kind of changed everything <laughs> after that point. But, um, but it was really Tom's influence uh, at the, w over all of those games that we made it in in the, in the early days. And, uh, and then with Doom, it got even like crazier. And then Tom left it halfway through because it just wasn't his kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but then Doom, create, you know, Doom came out the way that, that uh, the rest of us wanted it to be. Is that it? Great. Thanks right. for the very inspirational talk. There's Thanks. one organizational thing. I see many of you are getting hungry and nervous. 
there's also beer from the barrel on the first floor <laughs> and, and also um, something to eat. Uh, we have also beer and wine o over here. Um, so you can go wherever you want, wherever there's uh, less people. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be yes. at this table here. And, <laughs> and if anyone wants to, want to buy a, a poster or a book, we're only selling one or the other because we want to make sure that everybody is... Oh, sorry, they're free. <laughs> I saw, sorry, I didn't know that they were free. So one, one or the other, you get to choose either you want to read a 300-page book about <laughs> what I just told you, um, or you can get a Doom poster uh, that is a, a unique Doom poster that you can't buy anywhere. Um, so yeah, it's either one or the other. So we'll just have a line of people, I think, going down the front here. And, uh, and then if you want me to sign something, then I'll sign it. Thank All right, you. thanks. <laughs>